Hello, Tom speaking. Hey, Tommy, hey, how you doing? Good, man. I am ready. You ready? Yeah. Good. I got. I'm mic'd up, ready to go. I'm just trying to get your audio though. Can you hear me all right now? Yep, it's perfect. So I'm on speakerphone, so I didn't want to. Yeah, you may. I don't know. You're in a quiet place. Sometimes speakerphone doesn't work. Yeah, it's, it's nothing else on. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was doing the intros to the show, just basically saying that uh, it's uh, the Eddie Morgan show. We're going to talk about uh, um, jazz and and trumpets, uh, the jazz trumpet artists. Uh, I picked out seven artists that I was into, and um, I was actually just riffing on each artist you know, before you, you called about what I thought was great about them. Um, and... Right. And we'll, uh, I don't know what your, I have an idea what yours are, but uh, if you're ready to go, we'll just wing this thing, I think. Yeah, I wrote down some notes and um, some things that maybe, I, you know, that I might not remember to just talk about, but, yeah, you know, just a little preparation, so I'm ready. All right, we got it. Uh, Eddie Morgan, welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. <laughs> Great to be here. Yeah, our paths cross on a regular basis lately, and I and I feel that uh, it was time to do a great co collaboration. We were just looking actually for something to do, and uh, bef because because you are a um, a master trumpet player and and uh, very charismatic uh, on stage. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's something that I feel that um, you know you you must have learned that chop somewhere. So we decided to like pick out our, our artists that we uh, have used as, as um, um, that we admire or maybe even use as uh, for your, I don't play the trumpet, but for you, it may be someone that you um, use to kind of form your, your craft. Um, presently, you're out in the, in the city of Atlantic City um, gigging on, a, on a, a, a weekly basis at Kelsey's. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a nice urban, um, a dinner theater, I guess you would say with right. really awesome food and a great ambiance right. to it. And you're out there uh, once a week and you get a great crowd that comes out. Well, I was once a week on Wednesday. Uh, I, I hate to correct you, but they changed the schedule, uh, before Thanksgiving. Uh, we did about four weeks in a row and, uh, when the holidays hit, they canceled it out, and I don't know when I'm going to be back. I did one date on Fridays because Fridays is when we normally play Kelsey, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the Wednesdays. Uh, they're kind of all over the place with what they're doing because they have so many groups that they try to cater to getting in there to perform. And uh, so I, even though I was the first one to open up Kelsey with my trio, uptown in the little place that they had on Melrose. Uh, we, in fact, we did a Valentine's Day about eight years ago, something like that, eight, ten years ago. And um, then they moved to the big place on, on Pacific, Kentucky and Pacific. So it was, you know, it's one of those things. They, they have a lot of bands now. We were like one of three before, and now they have like 15 or 20 that they're trying to squeeze in between the Fridays and Saturdays that they uh, they do business. And then they were doing Wednesdays and Thursdays with the same group. And they do Sundays with Tony Day. So it's a great venue, though. And uh, like you said, the food is indeed delicious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I caught you on a good one then because it was a Wednesday. And I, I right. back in the day uh, when I used to live in Atlantic City, I, I met and knew Tony Day. He's great. I didn't know he was there on a regular basis. Yeah, he's there every Sunday. Let's talk about um, how many. Uh, I brought seven uh, jazz trumpeters to um, you know to this meeting. I could have done more, and I was I was going through it, and I was like, uh, I gave honorable mention to three, uh, so I'm I'm walking in with ten. How many did you have? I didn't count. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay, you're rocking. You yeah. got, you got a lot of them. 
Well, and, and that's the, the, the case too, is like I could have added more too. And then I had some guilty pleasures where, you know, I'm a, I'll do the guilty pre pleasures people and then just kind of push off and we'll, we'll go dig into yours and see if there's any duplication between the two. Um, right. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Boney James. I'm not afraid to admit it. I think he puts out great records. He does great live shows. Um, he, he's not an innovator like the artists we're probably going to talk about. And sometimes that's okay. You know, I know when I buy an album of his, it's going to be great. And, um, he's what was that you said? Boney James. He's yeah. a saxophonist though. Oh, well then forget him. Let's edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to, let's go to, um, uh, Terrence Blanchard. Like he's, he's my honorable mention. Um, right. Yeah. I, I do like his stuff. Um, he did a lot of soundtracks, and um, I find him to be, uh, he just kind of can be able to create a, a, a full album. Um, right. You know, sometimes I come and go with him. I, I I like his head. I think he's a smart dude. I think he's great. I talked to him once and uh, got a picture with him, which was awesome. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't know if I'd put him in the same category of, of the artist that I'm talking about. But he definitely is uh, an innovator and um, and a, a really talented guy. Well, my Terrence Blanchard experience is um, is pretty uh, close to the hip because I met Terrence uh, through Ralph Peterson Jr., the drummer, the first time I met Terrence, and he was so personable. And he comes from New Orleans, and he's in that Winton Marcellus. Uh, mindset of musicians from New Orleans. Now, Terrence is a heady guy, like you said, he's real smart. Uh, he's very uh, well written in movie film scores for Spike Lee. But his his approach to uh, improvisation is very very similar to Winton. Sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. I think they had the same teacher. And I think Winton's father influenced them both a lot as well. But Terrence and I have seen each other outside of the, the, the meetings that I've had with Ralph down in Cape May at the Jazz Festival. Uh, he was there a couple times, and I got a chance to hear him and, um, and talk to him. He's a world traveler and well accomplished. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. He's great. He's like my last one on the list. I do his... Uh, Mo Better Blues. I play his um, his, his record while well, his uh, composition Mo Better Blues was a theme song for the Spike Lee movie Mo Better Blues. Okay. With Denzel Washington. Yeah, yeah I, I, play that. I met him once, um, and it was at the Mid Atlantic Jazz Festival, and he was doing an interview, and his handler told me like he's not going to talk to you. And I we made eye contact, and I said I I didn't know you were so funny because. He did a show in, at the Man Music Center where he was just doing the music from the scores of Spike Lee. And he had mm -hmm. Angeli Kijo there. He had um, uh, Susanna Baca, uh, who's a Portuguese um, right. singer. And he had um, some other guests there, too. And uh, he was riffing with the audience, and everyone was laughing. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that was the craziest show. He goes... Do you remember when I kicked that girl out? There was a girl that kept on saying, I want to have your baby. I want to have your baby. And they kicked her out <laughs> of the whole thing. So, and that, and uh, so we were able to get a picture out of that. And his hand, I looked at the handler and I said, I am sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to grab him, even though psychologically I probably did. Um, well, of course you did. Of course <laughs> I did. Everybody wants to talk to the artist. Well, you know, you're not just a, a strange person trying to, uh, you know, hook up with a uh, a musician, you know, if we're in the media, uh, you guys in the media, I should say, uh, always look for that opportunity. And I, I do it too because I'm a musician. Mm -hmm. When I go to a show, I if it's somebody I really want to talk to, I'm going to try to make it happen. And nothing's wrong with that, I, I don't think. Well, it, I worked at QVC and we were told not to act anything special towards the guests. Um, I worked at yeah. Li Live of the World Cafe, and we weren't supposed to act crazy, not ask for pictures or ask for autographs or something. But yeah. I don't work at either of those two places, and I'm a fan. So, <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's now, like, I, 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 you know, I'm ser searching them out. 
All right, let's. What? Who do you have on your first list? Do you have any kind of organization, or are you just going off the list? Yeah, I kind of. Uh, I, I kind of put them in life experience and um, how they became an influence to me. Uh, of course, Louis Armstrong is first on that list because my sister and I used to watch uh, late night movies and sneak and stay up. And my older sister, she's like 15 months older than me, 16 months older than me. She um, and I would turn the TV on when my mom would go to sleep early, and we would stay up and watch Louis Armstrong with Frank Sinatra or Velma Middleton or uh, Ella Fitzgerald, all the, you know, the old movie musicals. And Louis was just that first influence. So when I got into fourth grade, the instrument that struck me as, you know, one I wanted to play was the trumpet because Louis played the trumpet and sang. And he was such a, a, you know, like a warm spirit. And I said, wow, playing music is fun. And he's in the movies and he's, you know, traveling the world. And he became the ambassador for the United States. And so Louis was like that cat for me to want, make me want to play the trumpet. And so I, I started in fourth grade. And yeah. next, Miles. Oh, hold it back up because uh, I picked okay. Louis Armstrong too. <laughs> And I okay. and I totally agree with you. So we're in agreement. Now uh, I I'm the same way. I, I guess I'm in the same age group as you. I think maybe a couple years. Um, but we were raised on seeing Louis in, in in the fabric of what America was about. We got to hear him sure. sing "What a Wonderful World." And and um, when it first came out, not even when the second time it came out. Um, right. And we just realized that this guy is talented. He's an older guy. Um, when it came to um, you know, really digging him and really seeing who he was. It was the Ken Burns jazz series where they basically yeah. sent, you know, like hours just talking about Louie and why he is important and, and uh, why he's so special and the obstacles he yeah. had in his life. And the fact that he is so like charming and he went through, uh, you know, the whole civil rights racism before that and come out sure. as a, um, an advocate for change. He's 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 a superstar in my book. But what struck me about him was the Hot Five. Hot Five, never heard of him. Hot Five, Hot Seven. There was a whole yeah, yeah. there's a whole alternative life of Louis that that um, didn't exist to me. I just thought he was that old guy singing those songs, and he does right. such a great job, you know, with Hello Dolly, etc. But right. this Hot Five, this Hot seven is mind blowing today and I, I picked uh strutting with some barbecue from December Yeah, uh, what a great recording, right? Yeah, from and it's nineteen twenty seven and you're just this guy is blazing um and trailblazing at the same time and the fact that they've cleaned up exactly. those recordings it's um it's a it's a blessing. It's awesome. Yeah, those um those tunes that they played uh, and strutting with some barbecue. I, I took a stab at um, throughout my my years of you know trying to learn the standard uh, trumpet repertoire. I took a stab at all the artists that I have on my list in terms of their recordings and trying to you know uh, play them. And when I finally found some some books that had those tunes in them. I, I said, wow, you know, trying to play these tunes and listen to them and the speed at which they handled the, the virtuosity of his skills was, um, you know, unbelievable. And I'm trying to play these things and I'm having a really, really hard time, mm -hmm. you know, as a uh, as a college student and uh, and later when I really would have a little, you know, a few times, a few minutes to practice while I was teaching, um, and I really, really never got that proficient on a lot of those tunes because they are so hard. Yeah, and if you think about it, like he was only he was uh, shooting for commercial viability, like he wanted hits. And you can put that complicated, you know, time signatures and riffs and and how fast they were going in a pop song. It's it's pretty pretty amazing. Um, yeah, we only wish that like, pop music today would consider the how much he put into it um okay so what your next person is miles davis yep i have him also 
Yeah. Well, what 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 took me to Miles next was the difference of what he was doing. Um, the birth of the cool, the all that cool bop uh, attitude uh, led me, and I heard around midnight, and that was it for me. Uh, and I, that was the first, um, the first solo jazz wise that I ever played um, on a gig uh, was around midnight. Not that I, I, I just loved the melody, and it wasn't like it was a big solo thing for me because improvisation came much later in terms of comfortability. But uh, and even some nights are still not comfortable. <laughs> but um. You know, Round the Night was that, that song for me with Miles. And then, of course, his Bye Bye Blackbird, uh, the um, uh, Sir with the Friends on Top, uh, My Funny Valentine. I can go on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Miles' recordings. And um, just, just so many that uh, I, I mimic and love. I, I do, uh, what's the other one we do? Uh, blues, what is it called? Um, I mean, I'm losing the trend of thought on that, but uh, so many tunes of miles. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you have to buy into who he is and what he portrays himself to be. And, uh, you know, for anyone who self promotes yourself as like mysterious and, and sharp dressed man and um, aloof and creative and, um, you know, you know that there's a genius mind working in there at all times, and everyone accepts it. There's no like denying that. Oh, that he's a genius. Like you just know it because his catalog is uh, is crazy, and right. and that's where I always tell people if you haven't seen the movie Miles Ahead, um, I look at it. A lot of people hated it because <laughs> that they they just didn't feel it was a truthful uh, story, and and I look at it as Miles is as a superhero where uh, yeah. he's solving crimes, he's in capers, he's doing stuff because Miles is Miles. He's 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 better than everyone else. It's his mind that will get him out of trouble. It's his mind that will come up with the next thing. Yeah, and, he was tough. But you know he was a boxer, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's Yeah, and Roy Ayers, Roy Ayers and I became close friends and Roy recorded on on uh my first C D. But he was he would tell me about his time with Miles, and Miles would want to want to box everybody in the studio. <laughs> he would just want to box, and nobody wanted to mess with Miles because Miles would fire you up because <laughs> he was a boxer. Yeah, and uh, he 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 used that as like a, a leverage to get the musicians to do what he wanted them to do. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> he kind of like threaten them. I heard that he would do, you know, just a couple takes. Oh no, that was a monk. Never mind, it was a monk story. <laughs> but <laughs> in uh, 1984, I was 18 years old. Um, with my own money, you know, I was listening to pop music, and I bought right. Decoy album. And it's not his best album, but it's, it was pretty good at the time. And um, I was mm -hmm. reaching out to Senra and Coltrane and Captain Beefheart, and I was just kind of exploring like uh, the parameters of of a uh, you know non-commercial music and uh, i bought the decoy mm -hmm. album and i loved it and then i was and that was during his like bug-eyed like glasses that he would wear and you know he mm -hmm. he was on saturday night live and i was like it, it, it didn't it was years later that i was like oh my god I've, he has all this other stuff too that i can get into and it's it um, it completely changes and morphs throughout the his lifestyle. Um, on the corner, Jack Johnson, Miles Ahead, um, right. sketches of Spain. It goes on and on and on. Decoy is not like a winner, but um, it's pretty damn good. <laughs> so uh, it's a mile well. I I'm yeah. I'm not even familiar with the Decoy album. Um, I had uh, I had seen Bitches Brew. And because of the title, I just bought it. I said, this got to be something crazy that Miles is doing. Uh, so I want to check it out. And it turns out it was like stuff that I really didn't like, but I could understand, you know, his his evolutions, uh, how he was going and searching for like that rock stardom, that 
uh, avant-garde stardom mm-hmm. cuz he had already conquered the 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 bebop stuff to a, a high level and he he didn't want to stay there he was always looking for what's next for me to to conquer and that's that's why I, like you're saying he's a superhero he was he was really that in terms of his ability to uh re- revolutionize his sound his style and of course his confidence on stage he would turn his back he would do a, you know he just did what everyone did and uh he was that he was that cat that everybody respected and hated at the same time. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he gave you that in to hate him, but you're right. You know the one thing about him is that he did put albums out that were really challenging. But you know I don't look at it as a fault. I look at it as like I'm not ready to receive it yet. Like I don't I'm not uh, connected enough to find out where this is going. Some of the uh, Ornette Coleman albums or older Coltrane albums, they're challenging. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, in my 20-year-old, you know, body, I'm not there yet, but um, I, it's always there for me to give it a shot and try later. So, right, yeah. right. So, yeah, I, I totally respect the fact that you're like, look, not everything Miles we, did was fantastic to your ears, right. but as his body is work, it's amazing. Like, no one else amazing. is doing it. Yeah. I got to tell you a funny story. Um from my Happy Place uh, article in the press, Black City Press, a lady saw uh, that I love jazz, and she called the writer of the article at the press and wanted to give me a collector's item of Miles's, um, you know, set of uh, Kind of Blue. And um, so I went, met with the with the uh, lady, and she gave me this this beautifully uh bound uh book and uh and record and C D all in in case in this uh you know, like I said, collective item of Miles' kind of blue because you know it sold more records than any jazz album. You know, they tied all of that with it, but I can't believe I I'm in possession of this and it, she just gave it to me. It was unbelievable. That's awesome. Yeah, hold on to yeah. it. <laughs> it's like it's Yeah, funny. I'm you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give it to my daughter. Um, because my her and my granddaughter and one day somebody's gonna want you know. And I played the album uh one time since I've had it and I'm not gonna play it again to, to risk that it gets scratched. You know, but uh it's it's in mint condition. What um where are you at with your next artist? Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown. Okay. So, uh he's a Delawarean. We know that. But yep. uh what what's what's so um uh, exciting about Clifford? Clifford came along because my high school band director or assistant band director started Atlantic City High School came from Hampton uh Institute uh, in Virginia, which is the HBCU, and he came to us when I was a junior at Lang City High School, and he started teaching theory, and he was a trumpet player. Uh, Joe Brown is his name. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's retired as well. Um, but Mr. Brown taught me, uh, he, you know, when I was asking, because that was when I was starting to really become curious about other trumpet players and his favorite was Clifford Brown. So he turned me on to uh, Clifford and I started searching out other uh, songs, but the main song that I heard um, was his version of A Train, which sounded like a train. So that was uh, one of my first transcriptions for my band. When I got out of college, I started, um, my own quintet and uh Donald Bird and uh Clifford Brown and uh Lee Morgan and others uh influenced the music that my quintet played because it was a traditional sax trumpet, bass drums, keys configuration to all of those uh recordings. So but Clifford in that A train uh and the the fluidity of his line 
you know, clipper with strings, uh, the beautiful stuff he did, um, just, just, just phenomenal. But his whole approach and how smooth he plays, I said, wow, if I could learn to play melodies like that, <laughs> you know, I could make a life in this music business. So Clifford was that cat um, that turned me on to a whole nother style. Yeah, I am. Um... Yeah, I'm a fan of his also. Uh, who else do you have on your list? Lee Morgan kind of comes next. Well, between Lee Morgan, Dizzy Gillespie, and Donald Byrd, um, all of them I started bouncing around. Uh, but Donald Byrd, the first song I ever transcribed was Nika's Dream. Um, him and Hank Mobley on the, uh, uh, the Jazz Messengers, 1956. Columbia Records uh, version of uh, Nika's Dream, and I liked it because it was like a duet. The 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 harmonies that the sax player would play, the melody was played by the trumpet, and the arrangement of that whole recording made me want to uh, play tunes like that. So the fifties, the music of the fifties, the mid fifties to late fifties, early sixties, was what I patterned my uh, Eddie Morgan Quintet when I started like 18, uh, 1988, 87. I was teaching since 81, so I was longing to do some playing, but nobody was calling me to play. So I, by like 86, 87, I said, I got to start my own band and found some friends that were willing to join me uh, and uh, we embarked upon these tunes because they were challenging and, uh, you know, there was nobody else playing. So I said, well, that's what, that's the niche I'm going after. And I always wanted to do jazz uh, on a performance level anyway. I got out of doing James Brown, Earth, Wind & Fire, all that stuff when I was a teenager. Uh, so when I went to college, jazz kind of took over my desire even more, you know. Well, even at down the bird. Yeah, Donald Byrd's awesome. But even uh, at that time period, there was an intersection between R&B and jazz where uh, right now everything's split and you're like, okay, I'm a jazz fan, but you have to look listen to a jazz station and you have to do this and that. Even on the R&B charts, jazz songs would pop up, instrumentals, and um, it was really, uh, it was okay to have a you know a jazz album mixed in with your R and B, it was it was right, it was normal. Right. The, yeah, the it, categories it, were like you said they were crossover, like with Ramsey Lewis, um, Herbie Hancock, uh, Crusaders, uh, the Crusaders. Yep, um, you know a lot of groups were were in that vein, and then of course uh, Lee Morgan with Sidewinders kind of started it. Yep, that whole thing. Is that your next person you want to talk about? You want to talk about Lee Morgan? Lee Morgan, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Um, my uh, grandmother's very good friend, who we call Aunt Maddie, would come to our house every summer. So Aunt, Aunt Maddie and her son and grandson and and her family became like our family because they they spent a lot of time with us. Well, he was a sax player. And when I was starting, uh, when I was playing in my band, we practiced in my garage at my at my house. Uh, my grandmother and mom, you know, we all lived in Venice Park. And so he he came out to the garage while we were practicing one time and listened to it. And he said, I played with with uh, Lee Morgan, but I want to tell you something. And he, and he, and he pointed his finger at me. And he had like a shaking, uh, you know, nervous condition. And he he told me, I want to tell you, his name was Edward Lee Morgan. Yeah, Edward King Morgan. And I never forgot that because I didn't know Lee Morgan's first name was Edward. You know, you were talking about Lee Morgan before, um, you know, that this is definitely someone you want to talk about. And I know the, the first thing I was like, oh, that's Sidewinder. So I went on uh, Spotify, went through his mix. And right. um, wow, good stuff. Uh, it's weird how contemporary he is, and the uh, like. He when when he did his solos, he stepped out. He stepped out uh, and uh, 
you know, went in different directions, which I thought was pretty cool because he was, you know, it's a really tight group and, and they're focused on, um, you know, just the, the, the song at hand and then bang, this solo comes out and you're like, wait a minute, he's doing something really crazy here. Uh, well, Lee, Lee with me, with, with uh, Blakey, um, I, the main cut I do, uh, I like, I like of his is, um, uh, 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 Joyce, no, that's Clipper Brown, I'm sorry. Um, what was the tune? Now I'm getting them mixed up. I got to look mm-hmm. on my notes. What is Go ahead, about? tell me what you, I'll find it, I'll find it. Lee Morgan was, what tune did I play by Lee? The, the, the Sidewinder is, is like epic, you know. Yeah, no I never, I, I never could play it. That was one of those tunes that, um, because of the range of the melody going up to the high, it was like a high D and E. I I could never play those notes when I was younger. Now I can play it, uh, but I now it doesn't fit like where we play and and the audiences that we um, play for. <laughs> I have to do like something special to fit Sidewinder into a set. You know, even though it's a great tune, I don't think a lot of people will, other than the age group, if they're older people in the, in the audience, they would appreciate it. But most of the time, it's nobody in that age group that that I'm playing to, you know? Sure. You know, and I don't want to alienate the audience. I'm, I'm like that uh, Louis Armstrong philosophy of entertainment first. Um bringing people into uh, make them laugh, make them cry, make them tap their foot, make them dance, make them make them have a good time. That's that's my thing. If I'm not if I'm not having the, the audience participation and and all of that with the music that we're playing, I switch it up to to get their attention. You know, um, that's that's what I feel is important. What'd you get on those notes? Did you find them? Say again? That you were looking for your Lee Morgan notes? Yeah, the tune, I didn't write down specifically the Lee Morgan tune I had written down. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Here it is. Here it is. Jazz, um, uh, No Room for Squares. When he was with Hank Mobley on Hank Mobley's uh, recording of No Room for Squares, Bob Perkins used to play this tune like every day for years almost <laughs> and I fell in love with the tune No Room for Squares but he didn't play it every day but he played it regularly on the show and Vibe has been that influence for me I don't know if you ever listen to Temple Public Radio oh loved it yeah yeah it's... and Bob and I have become good friends I've written theme songs for him BP with the GM and uh, he plays it every now and then on a Sunday program and once in a while during the week on his uh, he'll he'll play it, but there's a vocal version that I had recorded as well, and um, it's a tribute uh, to Bob, of course. He's he's phenomenal. He's back on the air, you know. Uh, Temple was uh, pivotal for it, like that was a a learning. Like I lived in Philly for 14 years, so uh, oh, Tem- okay. Tem- Temple Jazz was um, a training ground for me to learn, and uh, yeah. They were really great. When they flipped it to half classical, it le- it lost its mojo for me of, of what they were trying to get across. But uh, right. yeah, I, I loved um, I loved uh, Temple Jazz. I, I wish there was a um, a station you know very similar to that. There's there really isn't. Um, did you ever did you pick Dizzy Gillespie as one of your people? Oh yeah, Dizzy. Yeah. I, I got to meet Dizzy. I got to meet Dizzy when I was in college. Oh, get out. At Glassboro, um, I was the Bureau of Musical Organization president. And my last semester, the uh, the lab band, which was led by Manny Album, he invited him and Dizzy were friends from New York. And he invited Dizzy to come perform. And uh, this was in 1980s. Fall of 1980, and Dizzy came, 
And uh, I got a chance to sit and interview him and for the campus uh, radio station, uh, newspaper, or whatever. And the girl took pictures of me and Dizzy. Wow. Uh, that, should be, and, uh, that should be in your happy place. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you know what? I can't find the picture. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I Moving around, um, I haven't been able to put my hands on it. Uh, I don't think I lost it, even though in Sandy, uh, my mom's garage full of stuff that I had in there all got messed up. Um, I, I don't think that picture was in there. I just haven't been able to put my hands on it. So uh, hopefully hopefully it's in the archives at Glassboro, uh, Rowan now. Um, and I, did, I did a, a thing, uh, kind of like a footnote here, sorry, uh, at Rowan that uh, alumni spotlight, and I talked about it for that as well. Uh, trying to get back into that, I want to do an alumni concert out of at Rowan. Um, I went to school with um, uh, uh, the, the head of the department now, Jazz Studies. Um, he played with Maynard, Barry Sax player. Um, uh, then he... Um, the Blasio. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I I have a lot of. That's why it's the he's local and he form. he lives locally. He well he's from, I think he's from up around Glassboro, mm. but he's not he's not a Lang City guy. He's he's a Philly area somewhere out there. I think that's where he's from. But him and George Rabbi, George was a trumpet player or is a trumpet player. His father owned a music store in Millville. Um, I, when I transferred to, when I transferred to, um, uh, to, um, Glassboro from Moravian, they were practicing in a, um, in a rehearsal studio and they were doing Jamie Aversol and I had never heard that stuff and they were, they were swinging and, and playing the heads and, you know, having a good time with like three or four players and they were all taking solos and learning jazz and that was the training ground for the lab band so when I got to Glassboro I started doing stuff like that with them and then they all left because they were older and well then he went on the road with Maynard uh, well, I don't know if you know, he went on the, on the road with um, Maynard Ferguson and became his musical director from the Barry Tone Sax chair. See, I told you, like, Maynard had something going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you forget how many great songs and how, uh, you know, as a kid, I was like, is this Chuck Mangione or Maynard Ferguson? Who is this? And uh, I find that the catalog of Maynard Ferguson is, is a lot more appealing than Chuck Mangione. Um, right. I, I think there's a lot of really great material out of there. Um when I wanted to talk about Dizzy Gillespie, just because I, I had some notes here, is that I like, <coughs> if I could be anyone, if I could be reincarnated to any jazz guy, I'd want to be Dizzy Gillespie because he radiates like some warmth and uh, he just seems like a really cool guy. I, I can't seem to put my, my finger on it other than the fact that um, he sells his music by being him. Um, and he's mm -hmm. he's creative. He did the uh, you know all the the stuff with um, Charlie Parker, and then then wove into the whole Afro um, Cuban sound and kind of dug in there, and 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 then he became an elder statesman, and you know you'd see him you know hanging out with the Muppets and stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah, he's he's my guy. Like he's if I would put a picture up on the wall, it's not that I. I dig his music the best is that he's the coolest guy that i know <laughs> like he's <laughs> by far the coolest like um jazz icon out there and uh even he even dressed cool i i just wish that uh i don't know somehow he uh, uh there's a there was a time that i was running around trying to get if you notice there was a a, a poster or a great picture of mm -hmm. him blowing a bubble so he had his cheeks puffed yeah. out like he always did, and then he had this big bubble gum bubble. And, and, and right, uh, yeah. yeah, I had I had a copy of that picture somewhere too. Yeah, I wanted to frame that. I wanted to find it, frame it, and I had a T-shirt of it, 
and I never got the 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 uh, frame of it, but uh, right. I thought well he just epitomizes cool to me, just d downright cool. The out the man take a, a, a song is on Afro. Um, that whole album is awesome. That whole period of his was awesome. Um, yeah, that's the Stephen um, coalition that they he formed with Dan Pozo. Yeah, and he, all those Cuban artists. Uh, it's amazing that that revolutionized Latin, Afro Cuban Latin, whatever uh, styles in New York and Cuba, and it brought us musically close together in terms of what what the marketplace yielded you know what i mean definitely so many artists come from cuba and in new york <laughs> yeah that that are that are strong well dizzy dizzy uh came the ballad this is the other thing after i did the interview with him at glassboro uh and johnny lynch was at that concert i, I think i told you about Johnny lynch leading the club all band did i tell you about that yet no uh -uh. no okay well that was tied in with dizzy that i was um, Johnny Lynch, my mom used to take us to Club Arm. So seeing entertainment, he was the band leader uh, of the Club Harlem house band. And he was a trumpet player, so, and my mom knew him. So I would go over his house sometimes, ride my bike, because he only lived about five blocks from my mom's house. I would go and sit and talk with him on his porch about playing trumpet and entertainment. And he, was, he, was, he wouldn't talk a lot. He would just he would smile, and I think he was like drinking. <laughs> You know, he was, he was sitting on his porch, you know, tasting and just chilling out. And here I am, this kid who wants to learn trumpet and play. And never taught me any lessons. But when he came to uh, Glasgow to hang out and uh, listen to Dizzy's concert, I was there. So he introduced me to Dizzy as this kid from Lancaster. He was an up-and-coming trumpet player. And I thought that was really cool, you know. But, uh, and, and, and Dizzy kind of gravitated to me. So when he came after that to Bally, he played in the in the um in the lounge, uh, Billy's Pub. Dizzy headlined in there for I think it was like three or four shows on a week on, on one or two weekends. Well that's awesome. Yeah, and I got to talk to him again, uh, because I was hanging out at Bally's uh, all the time anyway. But and I worked it. I had worked there too. But uh, that's my dizzy uh, stuff. But he was a strong, strong uh, entertainer and um, fun guy. You know, he 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 bridged the gap for so many uh, different artists. But and, and what a great trumpet player. Yeah. Night in Tunisia. I mean, uh, John Fantasy. It's his clone. I don't know if you know who John Faddis is. Uh, he plays like like Dizzy. You, it's hard to tell them apart. He, he plays so much like Dizzy. And I true sound of all as well. Uh, my next one is, I think I, when I talk to you, uh, your nose curled up. And I totally understand it. It's Herb Albert. And the only reason uh, I picked Herb Albert is that it's nostalgia. You know, the... Uh, when I was a little kid, my parents only had two albums, and they were Herb Albert albums. So, and in Tijuana Brass. Yeah, yeah, we would play them, and, you know, it, it's very corny, and <laughs> and it's very 60s. You know, that kind of sound is like the theme song to, you know, the dating game or, or laughing. I know, but it goes da 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 Yeah. Yeah. Herb Albert was cool. I, I play Rise. Uh, yeah, well, Rise is awesome. Rotation is awesome. Yeah. He did but those songs are different, way different than what he played in the sixties, like you said. Yeah. He was he was see him and Herbie Mann and a couple of others that I, I can't think of right now, but they they were um that sixties group of and even like Doc Severinson. The first jazz concert I ever saw was Doc Severinson on the boardwalk here in Lang City. And um then I my mom took me to Great Adventure to see him like two weeks later. So he he was my first two live trumpet concerts, Doc Severinsen, because I saw him on the Tonight Show. I said, "Molly, I want to go see him," and I was old enough, you know, uh, to understand who Doc Severinsen was at that point. And he was great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a whole um, time period where you know Herb Albert and A and M Records 
brought on a lot of artists and was i don't know he, he's probably the richest musician uh of all time in that jazz world just by his experience but I, I, in in reality he's a footnote in jazz i don't think he's uh an innovator in any way um but he's etched in my mind as one of my favorites just because i, I was kind of raised on him right herb albert and like like you said doc Levinson. then led, that led to clark terry um because he played in the tonight show band and i got a chance to meet clark terry uh with ellis marcellus and, and clark was in cape may he um uh, Woody had him down there for the K May Jazz Festival. And Clark was kind of failing in age, but man, he still got on stage and played like unbelievable. And sang mumbles. And uh, yeah. Clark was amazing. He he, was, his technical ability was unbelievable, too. He would go up and he's a, a blue noter. He'd be up a blue note all the time in New York. So, right. Yeah. yeah. What? Well, uh, that was the hangout. Where, where did, um, what else do you have on your list? Uh, I got Art Farmer. He's one of those cats that was on the outside of the mainstream cats, but he was like so far ahead of many of them. Uh, and you know who I forgot? Um, which is crazy. We talked about Freddie Hubbard. Uh, but yeah. he was fit. He was fit before Art Farmer in terms of my um my my liking and uh how i grew up and like of jump spring um freddie's uh i can sing the tune but i can't think of the name of it i can't think of the name of the tune but anyway that's another one of my favorite Freddie Hubbard tunes of Dumb Spring. I, I, I used to play that. Uh, there's, there were some others that Freddie played. Uh, hmm. Yeah, he had, a, what was it? The, that Freddie Hubbard album is considered... First Light. What is that the name of the song? No, First Light was the name of the album. Yeah, it uh, was the name of the title track. It's too. One of, considered one of the best jazz albums of all time. Which one? Uh, yeah, I thought it's not church light. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to go on, on the internet and find out. Uh, yeah, first light was one of his one of his uh, first solo albums, I think. But Freddie was with Art Blakey um, and the Jazz Messengers. Like I was teaching general music the last couple of years. I don't know if you knew that uh, at Leeds Avenue School. So I was exposing my students to. The, you know, kindergarteners through fifth grade, I was exposing them to all my favorites. And I was actually learning and teaching myself some new things that I didn't necessarily know as well. So, Freddie, I found some videos of him with Art Blakey that I really liked. Um, even with Lee Morgan also with the Art Blakey and the Moaning and all those tunes that they did. Art Blakey. Well, right um, now I'm hearing some kind of static on this phone. Oh, sorry. I don't know where that's coming from. Did you touch it at all? No, I'm, <laughs> I didn't change anything. So, but the weather <laughs> can do that. Yeah, there's a little little thing here. Uh, I thought, like, here, I'm going, I'm in the Wikipedia for, like, the best albums of all time. I know he's in the top ten, but I can't think of the album right now. That's Okay. Uh, I saw you had Sean Jones on your list. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we're doing a timeline, yeah, he's pretty up there. Uh, Sean Jones. Uh, there's the '90s and the and the early 200s, 2000s, is where yeah. I realized that there was this wealth of really great young artists that were coming out, and they were taking yeah. you know some cool things from the past, and they turned right. around and and just like. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're connecting it to what was going on in, in our world. Um, I'm thinking of like, like Chris McBride and, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, Stefan Harris and, right. and, um, 
the, uh, Orrin Evans would be someone that would be in that time period too. And right. And, and well, of and course, Jones. Ralph too. Ralph Peterson Jr. Yeah, they all like took took what's uh, what was historically important and then just gelled it right into what was going on in the world. And the the R and B music was really awesome too. Right. So uh, it it was a it was a great merger and and Sean Jones just kind of came out of that time period and and I feel uh, he's been um, you know uh, pushing the needle like on every time and he just moved to Baltimore. I was able to interview him for uh, live with, uh, live with the world. something came from Baltimore and uh, mm -hmm. he was really excited. He just got started working at the Peabody and uh, I asked him about one song called uh, Dark Times. Uh, right. It, it's just an album track. He played it live at the Mid Atlantic Jazz Festival. Told me a story. Told us a, a story about it. And um, you know, I was like, he, it, this was like a almost like a heavy metal song. The way they did it live. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if, if anyone doesn't like jazz and says, oh, I don't like jazz, but sat there and listened to this, would have been a fan. And uh, I, I, I was impressed. But yeah, I. Uh, uh, I'm a fan of his. Yeah, yeah. Sean, and you know what? One of the nicest guys, he's come to Chicken Bone Beach a few times. Um, I don't know if you know that. He was there last week. On the boardwalk. Or last in year. Yeah. City. yeah. Did you see him? No, nah, I wasn't here yet. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I was catching him. Like, he was playing uh, live in, in, uh, in Baltimore a lot. Like, he gigs out a lot. So, I was catching him there. Okay. I, I never. Yeah, I. I never, never saw him here. I never introduced myself, but I have his phone number still, and I would, <laughs> and I asked him if he wanted to do other things, and he he seemed to be pretty interested. I had this great idea, of like, and I going back to that last got, um, the last John Coltrane album that was uh, released, and, and we would review it together. And, oh, okay. And uh, he was in in in, in Europe. And he wasn't available uh, to do it, but he, was, right. he definitely got back to me. All righty. Well, that's he's, he's that kind of guy. Yeah. Then I saw you had Roy Harper, another another uh, influence of mine, um, and how he became part of those that Young Lions uh, tag of musicians in the um, as you say in the eighties, Winton after yeah. Winton and Branford. Uh, Roy Hargrove, uh, and um, what's the other guy's name? Dwayne Eubanks, even. Now Dwayne's coming on even stronger. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, he's coming on strong because I think his ties to the Philly Cats, but he's been in New York with Orrin Evans and Ralph. They're all, you know, bringing Dwayne out more to an international level. Because his brother, you know, was on the Tonight Show. Uh, Kevin Banks, the guitarist. Yeah, uh, so they've got a great musical tradition in their family too. Yeah, uh, Roy Hargrove. Uh, uh, I looked at his timeline. I was like, the first album that I got into was Family, 1995. Awesome album from beginning to end. And then he came right. out with uh, Habana. And that was 1997, and it had uh, Chuchu Valdez doing the piano. Great album, mm -hmm. awesome. Then he comes out in 2000 with a strings album, doing standards. Um, another great album. Okay, wait, hold on for a second. I have a, I have a, Is that the one that has um, uh, September in the Rain on it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, uh, that's the re that's the ultimate recording for me with Roy Hargrove. Yeah. And then he has another a live performance on YouTube that I really love. It's a tune called Saint Denis. The uh, then he came out in two thousand three with those that the trio albums, the R H Factor, where right. you know, he took every single like D'Angelo and and uh, Erica Badu and um, Michelle Donegacello and uh, he just grabbed. Um, all the the future stars together to make a, a, one, right. you know, a couple of great albums, um, and he and it's just great. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. I, I got a picture with him uh, at Cape May Jazz Festival too. I'm jealous of that one. Um, yeah. Do you have any more on your list? I got one more for you. 
Uh, well, we did. We talked about Terrence already. Um, pretty much, uh, that's the end of my list. I I got one. I got if I if I would have known you, I would have asked you to come along. I got uh, tickets to see Christian Scott. Um, Christian Scott is from New Orleans. He's thirty six. He I, I played with him. What? You didn't check. You haven't checked my Facebook page. No, no, I didn't. Go on, go on, check my Facebook page, Eddie Morgan. I'm playing in in my profile picture, not my profile picture, but my whatever. There's two different pictures. The background picture is of uh, at Martini Beach in Cape May. Kristen's playing. It's another trumpet player in the middle, and I'm on the far right. And we we were jam session after the, after the. Kate made jazz festival that night because they would have uh, a meal up at Martini Beach um, above Cabana. It's changed hands now, but uh, back then the musicians would come eat and they had a piano and we started playing and uh, Cat brought a couple drums up and we had a jam session and we ended up doing like Close to Walk With Me and different stuff. And uh, I'm playing alongside of Christian. Then I went to Philly and, and hooked up with him at the uh, Clef Club, studying with him uh, on a tune. He's a really nice guy, man. He's uh, he's putting out some really really interesting albums. Like they're yeah they're yeah. they're very like if you're talking about Roy Hargrove hitting that that nerve of R and B, like uh, Christian Scott's like going into uh, like trip hop and he's you know doing soundscapes. Um, yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. he's doing stuff that um, is it, just really pleasing to the ear, and um, he just has a brand new album out. My goal is to interview him for this new album, um, but I'm gonna see him, and I'm very, very jealous that you were able to meet him. But um, he's he's when is it? Uh, it's early March. Like I just got one ticket. I'm, I don't know if it's gonna sell it. It's over at, at one of the colleges. Oh no, not the college. Ardmore Music. Uh, yeah, Armor Music Club or something. He's there. And, yeah, and uh, I, I'm sure it's probably not gonna sell out, but um, it's awesome. Yeah, he's he's putting out some really good work. Yeah, I uh, I, I like this stuff too. In fact, um, I was listening to him uh, like last week uh, on a video that I found on YouTube. He did a tiny. Yeah, you, are you familiar with those tiny desks? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the uh, tiny uh, desks. Concert. Yeah. Um, I, he has one of those. And then I was listening to something else he was doing. Uh, I can't remember the name of the tunes or anything, but his style of his recordings now, he's gone into a whole different direction than, than anybody else. Yeah. And kind of Sean Jones mirrors some of the songs that he does but not quite as far avant-garde as Christian Christian yeah. goes a little bit further out I agree yeah he's he's doing something and I he's uh looks like he's reaching back into some some uh, African roots too bringing in right. some of that uh uh you know culture into his work which makes it even more you know mysterious and, and interesting to, to figure out but right. Good yeah. stuff. Good, awesome stuff. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So Eddie Morgan, we did an hour. We went through. We went through. <laughs> I don't know. We named off a lot of like trumpet players, and um, what we realized is that uh, while they they really um, helped you develop as the the artist that you are, that right. um, they were just fun for me to listen to, and it's kind of cool that we matched up on on most of them. Um, we just, I guess if it was two hours, we'd probably match up probably completely, but <laughs> yeah, 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 some people had to make the cut, right? They just couldn't make it. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, the thing is when you start talking about, and people ask me this all the time, who's my favorite trumpet player, who is my favorite one trumpet player. I'm like, how can you pick one? It's just not possible when you, when you start to understand the artistry of, of, of every trumpet player mm -hmm. and you find that he's your favorite and how he does 
this one thing, and then another guy's your favorite now. He does another thing. Uh, so it becomes that they're all your favorite. <laughs> yeah. Plus, there, you know, you're talking about the the art of you know improvis- improvisation. So, right. you know, you're you're like, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, anyone can bust out and do anything that you know, is different. So, uh, it's it's just uh, it's different. It, it just really, I think it's whoever you hold in your pocket, whoever you go to, um, and you you know you're going into Spotify and and um, you know there's a, a Wayne Shorter album I have to hear all the time, or there's a Mm-hmm. The, you know, a love supreme. I got to hear at least once a month, or I'm not happy. There's things that you got to do. So, and and uh, right, and uh, any artist in jazz world that that you say this is this is it. Um, there's some Mingus albums I I, uh, I have to have. Um, yeah, yeah. It gets to that point with with me um, that if I'm working on a song, I'll delve into that artist a little bit more for a couple of days and work on the song I'm trying to learn or try to get back under my fingers because I didn't play for the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, that's a part of my growth to add a bebop tune or add a, uh, a standard that I never really learned. But it broadened my horizons just enough to keep me going. Uh, and that's why it's a lifelong quest. And I tell, tell my students all the time that you know, jazz is something that you don't, you never conquer. Uh, you you can only hope to to be a part of it in a light in a, in your lifestyle. And if you get a chance to perform it for people, and they clap, then you know you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> Other That's... than that, you don't know you don't know what 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 out there to be appreciated from you to the audience. So. Whenever I get people to smile, like I was telling you before, uh, to, to tap their foot, to cry, to laugh, that's that's what I do. That's that's that, that's what entertainment and jazz for me, and my quest to do. And then of course I write stuff. You know, I write a lot of stuff too. So uh, I'm I'm on on the road to that. Hopefully one day my music will come out, and somehow I'll say, yeah, he wrote he wrote some nice stuff. Maybe yeah, I hope day. so. Maybe 20 years from now, people would be doing their podcasts and your name will be pro- popping up as one, one of the most influential. So you never know. You and, never know. You never know. I'm work, I'm still working on it, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Still so th- working on it. This is a good opportunity to, to wind this down. But I, I, I really appreciate uh, Eddie for um, hanging in there and, and talking about trumpet players with me. Um, I really You're welcome. Yeah, anyone that's in the on the East Coast, look for uh, the Eddie Morgan Trio. Uh, do you have a website? I have a Facebook page. Eddie Mor- I have several, actually, that outline my band. The Eddie Morgan page is the home page. But I have the Eddie Morgan Trio page. I have Rex for Jazz, which is my four-piece band. And that's R, capital R-E-K, apostrophe D, the number four, and J-A-Z-Z, Rex for Jazz. That's my quartet. And uh, then we have um, the Eddie Morgan and Rebirth, which is a uh, pop uh, kind of dance dance show band that I teach a female singer. It's like an eight-piece, nine-piece group that does festivals and concerts. Like we do Stone Harbor. Uh, so I do you know, a variety of things. And then I work with a duo, just me and the keyboard player, and uh, bring out the drum machine because we were doing that at uh, Tropicana with a guitarist too. I, was, I called the Trop Trio. So we keep we keep busy, uh, but not nearly as busy as I'd like to be now that I'm retired from teaching. Uh, anybody that needs music, get, feel free to hook, hook up with me. Yep. And, uh, He's available. I'm available. <laughs> I got time in my schedule. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got the people ready to go. You just need the gig. All right. That's it. All right, Eddie Morgan. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you very much for for hanging in there uh, with something came from Baltimore. All right, man. We did it. We, we, we had, well, it, yeah. It's a whole hour. We're gonna have to chop this down a little, but we did good. <laughs>